What's the best attack for the one-handed sword according to Angelo Vigiani? Hello there, Martin here from Schildwache Potsdam. And in this video series, I want to go with you a bit into Angelo Vigiani, a 16th century fencing master from Bologna that actually criticizes the common way of fencing, maybe the Bolognese system of fencing in its entirety and tries to reform it quite a bit. So Angeli Vigiani has dedicated his treatise to Charles V and later Maximilian II, the emperors of the Holy Roman Empire, which has actually quite a weight because in that time, if you dedicated your manual to an entity like the emperor, and it was, well, it, if it wasn't good, then you probably wouldn't live long to tell the tale. Well, Vigiani circumvented that by finishing his uh, book in 1551, but not publishing it through his uh, brother after 15 years after his death. So it got finally published in 1575 and it presents to us the most perfect play that Vigiani suggests to the emperor. So in this first video, I want to go more into the attacks that he proposes and the ranking that he gives them and also the guard positions, which are fairly special, especially the naming convention. So, Vijani says there are, in essence, three attacks. And it's, he argues the same as Giovanni della Rocchia, that there are punte, thrusts, mandritti, coming from the dominant side, and riversi, coming from the non-dominant side. While mandritti, of course, and riversi can come from all kinds of different angles. And in fact, there are an infinity of attacks which are just grouped into these three categories. Okay. How does he rank these attacks? Well, Vigiani prefers the thrust over any strikes or cuts. He says it's more lethal. It inflicts more grievous wounds that also have a smaller chance to heal. Okay, so it's the more lethal attack and therefore it's more noble and more perfect. He also argues that the, he has seen Mandrit Defendente, so descending blows from the dominant side, hitting an opponent in the head, but didn't kill them. So he argues the thrust from the same angle would be far better, especially if we take armor into the account. Okay, so he says the strikes is especially less useful the more armor the opponent wears. Okay, so he prefers the thrust over strikes, fine. But how about the strikes? Well, there he says he likes the uh, rovescio or roverso more than the mandrito, which is quite an unusual thing, since in the German treatises we are often told to attack from our strong side, so attacking with mandriti instead of riversi. How is the argument of Vigiani then? Well, he says, especially for the riverso ridoppio, so the ascending strike from one's non-dominant side, that it develops more power and also that it extends more, which is then again quite unusual because usually, usually, especially with a two-handed sword, I would argue that mandriti have more reach than riversi, especially if we are using our body in these strikes as well, which Vigiani says us in quite detail we should do and that's uh, the topic for the next video actually the body mechanics that are really accurately described by Vigiani. So what's the difference here? Well with the mandrito while we have our right shoulder forward we need to cover our inside. This means we can't just extend our hand straight forward but we need to move it a bit to the inside and a bit down to cover this angle. So while the maximum reach would be here, the maximum reach of a mandrito 
would lie around here. How is it for the reverse suridopio? Well, the reverse suridopio comes from the inside to the outside. So basically, since the other sword is already on our right, as a right-hander, we then can extend fully in a straight line. So, the maximum reach of the reverso, still with the right shoulder up front, would be around here. With the mandrita, it should lie here. And with just the straight point, it should lie around here. Okay? So the reverso, and that's quite important, extends more, which also means, with the one-handed sword at least, that the turning of the body only begins when we reach our maximum amount of reach. Okay? So, the next argument that Vijani makes is that it's also a great defensive blow because it basically gets everything towards our outside, which of course ends with the right hand, so we can have a really stable position. And also, since most opponents are right handers as well, the reverso naturally attacks the hands of our opponents, which is of course very useful if we want, don't want to get hit with swords. Okay, so it's the reverso over the mandrito, and the reverso is a great defensive blow. That's, uh, that we have to keep in mind now for his seven most perfect guards. So in essence, he argues again as well that there are actually an infinity of guards. You can have an infinity of positions. Each position could be named, but actually it's not. In the other Bolognese uh, sources, they are called Barata di Ferro, Gola Longa, Stretta, Larga, or Alta. And he even mentions Posta di Falcone. So basically kind of referencing Vadi at that point. And he says, well, these names attributing their characteristics to animals, that's not useful. So what he does instead, he just numbers them through and then he gives them a fairly lengthy description. So how are these guards formed? Well, the first guard is formed by drawing the sword. Okay, And it comes from the left side. So it gives rise, so from the non-dominant side, to the reverso ridopio, or rovescio ridopio. So it's a guard that is mainly striking a defensive blow. Therefore, it's guardia prima defensiva. And remember that he thinks that the thrust is the most perfect attack. So every guard that doesn't give rise to a thrust is therefore imperfect. So it's guardia prima defensiva imperfetta. And from here, we strike our reverso ridopio into the second guard, guardia seconda. This now is on the right side. Okay, so it's on the dominant side. Therefore, it gives rise to here especially a thrust, so it's perfetta. And since it's on the right, it's also offensiva, basically because it gives rise to the mandrito and his favorite attack, the imbroccata or punta sopra mano. So once again, first guard, second guard. It's also very important, but we come to this in the next week again, that the body and the feet are turning here as well. The third guard is from the full reverso, so the full reverso ridopio into basically a version of guardia alta, which is called Terza Guardia, so third guard, it's again offensiva, but it's imperfetta because it gives rise to a strike and not a thrust. From here, if we strike the full mandrito down low, again with the turn of our body into basically Porta di Ferro Laga, it's the fourth guard. Uh, quarta Guardia, it's again defensiva and imperfetta. It's also called now Larga because the sword is white. So, prima guardia imperfetta defensiva, seconda guardia alta, because the hands are high, perfetta offensiva, 
Terza Guardia Offensiva Imperfetta in Alta. And here we have Quarta Guardia Defensiva Larga and Imperfetta. From here, if we just strike a half blow, so basically leaving our points in presence of the opponent, we arrive in Porta di Ferro Stretta or Quinta Guardia Stretta because the hands are low but the position is, uh, is preferable if you are close to the opponent. It's again defensiva and now it's perfetta because it gives rise to the thrust. From here, if we then go to the other side, so from this Quinta Guardia to our outside, we arrive in Sesta Guardia, the sixth guard, which is again larga, offensiva, and imperfetta because it doesn't give rise to a thrust. And the last one, it's Settima Guardia, so the seventh guard. It's again stretta because it's more useful in close play, while the larger ones are more useful in wide play. It's offensiva and it's now perfetta. Okay, once more from the front, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh guard. And from the side, the first, standing in profile because it's on the left side. The second, standing more or less frontal, even with the right shoulder withdrawn a bit. The third, the fourth, against, again uh, with a flank towards the opponent. The fifth, the sixth, and the seventh guard. Okay, you can basically think of it everything on the left, that's defensiva, everything on the right, it's offensiva. If the point's presented forward, it's perfetta. And if it's used after full blows, it's larga. If it's used after half blows, it's stretta. And if the hand is high, it's alta. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this first little insight into Angelo Vigiani's schermo. The next part will be how his perfect play is actually performed and then with a partner as well. Until then, take care. Remember to like, subscribe and share this video. Ciao!